welcome to NAPOD, where we provide NA speaker meetings and workshops in a podcast. We are an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us to be self-supporting by visiting NAPOD.xyz. Look for the donate link and drop a dollar or two in the virtual basket. If you're also an AA or have friends that are, please tell them about our other podcast, Sobercast. Sobercast features AA speakers and workshops in the same format as NAPOD. We upload a new speaker every day, and it's easy to subscribe by searching for Sobercast, that's two words, on any podcast player app or go to Sobercast.com. Enjoy the podcast, and thanks for listening. like to thank the committee for asking me to share this workshop. Um, I was kind of overwhelmed, um, both about the hour and a half length and the idea of doing three steps all by myself, and I thought, well, as soon as I say that out loud, I'll look down the clock, and an hour and 15 minutes will have gone by, and I won't have gotten off step 10 yet, so I'm going to try to just ignore all that, and then... Uh, tell you what I do with these steps. I, I try to stay out of thinking about this, um, kind of stop myself when I would catch myself, you know, getting into what am I going to say, because you know, you never wind up saying that anyway. So, um, I started doing step 10 when I had about seven months clean, and I started doing it in writing. And there really wasn't much of a a design for it. There was no pamphlet. Living the program didn't exist. And I started um, doing it in columns because it was continued to take personal inventory. So um, I would make a little column that kind of broke my day up into fairly small bits of time, like got up, sat around, got ready, left for work, you know, all through the day. And then I'd go back over that list and see what was going on with me at that time. That first column was just kind of to jog my mind. Um, and um, I benefited from that more than I can tell you. I had um, tried a little bit here and there with Step 10 for probably a month or so before I started to write it down. And I asked people, do you think I should be writing this? Well, you know. Whenever you ask that, they always say, whoever you ask, well, of course you should be writing it. You know? <laughs> what I noticed was that when I tried to um, go through the day in my head, it worked about as well as me doing anything else in my head. And I didn't really get an inventory. As a newcomer, I had a lot of um, moments in every day that weren't exactly based on principles of recovery. So I would kind of think from what I thought of as a disaster to the next one. Once I started writing it, I realized I didn't have days that were all bad. Neither did I have days that were all good. Yeah. But looking at the whole day like that meant that I had to look at the whole day and see that some parts were okay and some parts I was acting on defects uh, and that all my days were mixed. Yeah. While I might, when I sat down, think this is a terrible day or this is a wonderful day, you know, when I put it down on paper, they were all some of everything kind of days, you know. I, um, well, it seems like there's sort of at least two different ways of thinking about these steps. There's probably as many ways of thinking about them as there are people working them. But I know that there's folks that go through one through nine one time and then do 10, 11, and 12 for the rest of the time they're clean. And uh, that seems to work for them, more power to them. That's not um, my understanding of it. That's not how it is for me. Because I still utilize all 12. So for me, a 10 step is kind of a one-day slice. When I need to look at a bigger picture, for me, that's a four step. So having said that, these, these 10 steps are all one-day slices. What that's done for me is um, enabled me to make six and seven daily steps. It's allowed me, I think, to make progress on some defects 
because I get entirely ready to have them removed a lot sooner if I have to look at them every day. You know, I know that one reason I can get up and go to work today is because I got so tired of looking at lazy as the first thing on every list for months. You know, that I changed the way I got up in the morning just because I didn't like seeing that. You know, I don't write um, a whole lot in general on any given moment unless something fairly significant went on, and then I'll write some more about that. When I have those things that are, you know, kind of big deals or fairly significant or even something that I'm just tired of, you know, a little daily thing, but I'm tired of it. Those things I'll talk about to my sponsor. Sometimes I'll talk about them in a meeting. And you know, once you start talking about it in a meeting, it's going to get different. I um, I think that, um, that Step 10 has allowed me to see a lot of progress that I probably wouldn't have taken notice of you know, by keeping that kind of daily track of it in little ways. A lot of the daily little stuff. My son was three years old when I got clean. So, you know, just being able to watch six months later how much better I did in dealing with him when he threw a cereal out of the high chair onto the floor. You know, those kinds of things let me see that this program was working in ways that I'm not sure I would have noticed, you know, if I hadn't had one time during the day where I stopped and took a look. I think that getting into that habit allowed me to start the next day with a clean slate. It allowed me to do more about leaving whatever went on today that I was unhappy about or that I didn't like to get some kind of resolution with it either know that I needed to do more about it or be done with it, one of the two. And I wake up in the morning without a whole bunch of baggage left over from yesterday. Um, the promptly admitted part, eventually I learned that the reason it said promptly was because the more promptly I was about it, the better I was going to like the way I feel. That that period of time from when I recognized that I had been wrong or that I had wronged someone until I got something done about it was real uncomfortable. And the longer I stayed clean, the more uncomfortable it was. So promptly is there, in my opinion, like everything in the steps, to help me be more comfortable on a daily basis without using I have to tell you this story. It's one of those horrible, corny recovery stories, which I heard first year I was clean, and I've never forgotten it. And that's the payoff for listening to people tell them, is that you never forget them, and then you get to tell them to other people. Um, there are these two little boys out on the farm, and one of them was from the city, and they were out playing behind the barn, and they had to go to the bathroom. And the city boy, little boy said, let's go in the house. And the little boy off the farm said, no, we'll go right here. And the other little boy said, there's no place to wash my hands. And the little farm boy said, don't worry about it. The little city boy got kind of huffy and said, didn't your daddy teach you to wash your hands after you go to the bathroom? And the farm boy said, no, my daddy taught me not to pee on my fingers. And if you work step 10 rigorously and get real good about promptly admitting it, it will teach you the same lesson because promptly admitting it can get real uncomfortable. I um, I have more trouble with that when I know I could get away with it because it's anonymous. When the person I've wronged is that anonymous electric company clerk on the other end of the telephone who's not doing it the way I wanted to and I've lost my temper at her and she's just doing her job, you know, that kind of stuff where I don't know them, they don't know me, but um, it gets uncomfortable for me once I take a look at it, you know. There's a lot of that stuff 
that I can still do. There's a lot of it that I still do do. But it's just like the using. I can still use again, but I can't use in ignorance again. Mm-hmm. And once I look at that and know I was wrong, my ignorance is gone. Mm-hmm. And I can't um, ignore it and stay comfortable. So I have made those calls back. Half an hour later, sometimes the next day later, to apologize for losing my temper at the gal on the telephone. I've made those calls back or said to people directly in the cases where I did not believe what I said was wrong, but the way I said it was wrong. So I've been trying to say I was wrong for the way I said it, and you get, well, I knew you'd figure out you were wrong, and I just have to shut up and back off, because if I say anything more, I'm going to wind up having to make amends again. You know? It's important to me when I do that, that I don't say I'm sorry, that I say I was wrong. I said I was sorry a lot and didn't mean it, especially in active addiction, to where I would say, I'm sorry, um, to my husband at the time, and he'd just look at me and say, no, you're not. And he was right, because I was going to go do it again. Even if I didn't want to or hoped I wouldn't, the truth was, I was going to go do it again. So it's important for me to say I was wrong. It's harder for me to say I was wrong. Although sometimes I know I'm wrong, and I'm not sorry yet, because I'm just not that well every day. When my son was about four or five, and it's kind of one of the downsides of working the program around young children, I would lost my temper at him for something. And he came up, I was cooking dinner, and he came up and tugged on my shirt. He said, Mom, aren't you going to say you're sorry for yelling at me? And I said, not right now, I'm not, because I'm not sorry yet. So um, wrong is different, you know, for me. And um, I also find that it works better. When I start out a conversation with someone by saying, you know, I was wrong when I said that, did that, whatever, I have their immediate undivided attention. They're really willing to listen to that. Uh, And um, I think just the way my personality is, because arrogance has been a pretty consistent character defect, even though I know it's a cover-up for inadequacy, I still get into it. So there's like some value for me acknowledging that I'm wrong. I um, I worked that step in writing probably every night until I was about eight or nine. And I had moved. I had changed sponsors. I had gotten into such a habit with it that unless I'd had some, you know, true disaster go on, it probably took me five or ten minutes. If I forgot it, you know, went to bed without it, it made me uncomfortable. I'd get up and write it anyway. And I started talking about it with um, the sponsor I'd gotten when I moved. And she wasn't happy with the way that I did it and gave me a different way to do it, which I tried off and on to do for years. I tried it for 30 days straight one time. I tried it for 60 days straight another time. And it just, I just didn't get anything out of it. I didn't seem to learn anything. I didn't look at my character defects. There was a part of me that may have just been being stubborn. But I wound up spending, I don't know how many years, quite a few, where the bottom line was I wasn't working that step. You know, because I was in and out and back and forth and up and down with this other way. And um, finally, to a whole other course of events, I wound up with a different sponsor. And slightly before that, I had sort of secretly gone back to working the 10 steps the way I had worked it uh, for so long that had worked for me. And the difference I noticed was truly startling. For me, it was one of those times where I got to learn in a relatively easy way, you know, without having to uh, create a lot of disaster in other people's lives or get loaded again or any of that stuff. 
I got to see how easy it had been for me to put down something that had really become a regular practice and to get so comfortable having put it down once to not pick it up again for a long time and totally believe that my recovery wasn't suffering. And I was wrong. <laughs> once I started to uh, write the 10th step again, I could see what I had been missing, you know. But it just got, it got easy and comfortable. I'd like to tell you that I've gotten back to being just as rigorous as I ever was, but that's not true either, although it continues to get better. Um, I meet with the women I sponsor once a week, and we work through steps together. And uh, we were coming up on step 10, and I knew that, one, I needed to tell them where I'd been at with it, but that also I was going to get more and more and more uncomfortable as we started to read and talk about that step if I really didn't get back into doing it on a daily basis. I still don't think I'm, I would say that I'm totally there, but I do it um, far more nights than I don't. And I still get the same benefit from it, although I get different information. That's the way all the steps have been for me. The process really hasn't changed very much in terms of what I do. You know, this past year, the process isn't very much different than it was my first year in these rooms. But the information that I get as a result of the process does change. So I see that I don't have as much trouble with behavior as I did when I was new. I see that just because I feel or think in a way that's a straight-up defect of character doesn't mean I have to act that way. That's a gift of this program. But I see a lot about my motives that I didn't used to see at all and get to take a look at um, how deep my self-centeredness runs. how hooked in that is to anything I have strong feelings about. And still, that sets me up to having just done some inventory to get as close to entirely ready as I ever get to ask to have these defects removed. I was talking when we were standing outside just before this meeting about how sometimes it's difficult for me to try to focus on just a certain step or step because they get so intertwined that it's really hard for me not to get off into talking about other steps. And this is like a case in point. During those years when I was flaky at best with step 10, I never even let myself stop to think what that was doing in terms of 6 and 7. They suffered too because I wasn't taking a daily look I wasn't having near as many chances to get sick of whatever it was I was doing and be more ready to have it removed. So it's more clear to me now than it used to be that whenever I um, relax, you know, about one area, it's like throwing a pebble into a pool. You know, the ripples go out and affect all the other areas, whether I think they do or not. I um, I think I have happier days since I got back to being closer to where I'd like to be with this step. I think I do a better job and have more awareness of how I deal with the people that come into my life. And a lot of that is hooked into step 11 which is next on the agenda. Isn't that handy? Um, I guess like all the steps, this is one that, that I've been on a you know an amazing journey with. When I got here, I didn't believe in any kind of power greater than myself. Naturally, I started having to try to make some changes there when I got to step two for the first time. And somebody said, well, 
do you believe there's any power greater than you are? And if I'd been honest, I probably would have said no, because I thought that me and my fine mind um, were what was going to solve my problems. I was too new and too crazy to realize that me and my fine mind were what had gotten me there, which was locked up. And um, But I said, yes, I was trying to be compliant, you know. And just that was enough willingness for it to start to change that and, and some direction to get down on my knees and say please in the morning and thank you at night. And I started doing that. So that original understanding that I had was that something was working and I didn't know what it was and it was obviously outside of me and that was it, you know. There was not another detail to that and it was enough. I continued um, to get down on my knees twice a day. I had one of those sponsors that I was afraid to say no to long before I was afraid to say no to N.A. She was like five foot nothing, and I had no idea what I thought she was going to do to me. But I was terrified of her. So I did what she told me to do. And, um, you know, my life continued to get better. I got through those steps. And occasionally... I would have some little head trips, so to speak, about step 11. Gee, am I really seeking to improve it or am I only seeking to maintain it? Um, but because I was praying at least twice a day, sometimes more, I really didn't pay a lot of attention to it. It seemed like it was already covered. Only when I've gotten into situations where I was in extreme pain, have I gotten um, to where I paid more particular attention to step 11? And that was true for years. I think what I learned about that, I talk and I, and I listen a lot about change. This is a program of change. That this, that, and the other thing has to change. And that change is difficult and we resist it. I certainly do. And I think that um, it seems to me that it's only one change and it's always the same change when I take everything off it. And it's a change in the amount of trust I'm willing to put in God as I understand him. That every time it comes to one of those deals where I have a new surrender, where um, I'm real uncomfortable, or I feel real empty, or I'm in a lot of pain. More has to be turned over. I have to let go of something more. And that requires me to trust more, to give up more, to go a little farther about turning my will and my life over. And so at, at bottom, that's always the change. It's a change in how much reliance I'm willing to put in this power that I can't see or touch or hear or smell. And I think that's where the fear comes from and the resistance, along with the fact that I suffer from the disease of addiction, stubborn and have a fat ego, other than that. Um, and to me, it, it shows me the nature of the disease and how thoroughly I'm, I'm, you know, afflicted with it or have it or whatever you want to call it, every time I've done that, the result has been miraculous. Every time. And I'm resistant every time a new one comes up. So, so I, I you know, I remember my sponsor asking me, when has God ever said no to you? When has he ever not given you or done for you things that made your life better? You know, the answer is never. Not once. Sometimes at that moment I might have questioned it, but even with just a little bit of hindsight, never. Not once. So why, you know, do I struggle every time? 
was being willing to put more reliance there. I guess because I'm an addict. Because I have those character defects. Because there's still a part of me that um, is sort of like, well, I know you can do it really well, God, but maybe just in this one area you could use a little help and I can do it just a little bit better. You know? Um, it's never true. It causes me pain, and I know I will do it again. I don't know what it will be about next time. Because I'm in one of those little breathers right now. You know, you get a lesson, and then you get a breather, and then you get another lesson. Well, I'm in a breather. So I don't know um, what that's going to be about, but I guarantee it will come again. Somehow I won't see it for what it is. I'll resist it until eventually I give it up and take that next step in changing my understanding by putting more reliance there. I... Um, as I stayed clean, this understanding that I had kind of got different. It changed a lot from just that kind of no idea at all except something was working and it wasn't me to, I think, from listening to other people, from thinking, um, to where I could tell you a whole lot more about what this higher power was like, a whole lot more. I could tell you my God had a sense of humor, you know, and a lot of other details. And I got into a situation, and I promise, I can't even remember what it was. You know how that is? You remember the lesson? You don't even remember what the deal was anymore? And someone told me to make a list of 20 core beliefs, whatever those were. And I did that. So on my list were things like, I'm a good mother, my son loves me, uh, and it works, I can continue to stay clean as long as I do what I'm doing, some real basic stuff. And when I had the list made, they said, okay, now let go of them. And I was scared. Yeah. And in that fear, I realized that somehow, without me noticing it, I'd gotten into this thing that this stuff worked because I believed it. Which for me was just another intellectual power trip. And I had to understand that this stuff worked because it works, whether I believe it or not. You know? I didn't become powerless over my addiction because I accepted step one. Anyone that ever saw me use, especially the last few years I was out there, could tell you that I was absolutely powerless over my addiction. It didn't get true because I started to believe it. It was always true. And so was all that other stuff. And somehow, through that process, I realized that I had forgotten that when I define something, I limit it. And that the way this understanding I'd had had changed over time was that this God I picked up in these rooms had gotten more and more like me. That all the new information I could give you about it made it more human. Sense of humor? What do I know? You know? And I let that stuff go too. So through this journey, what I've got today is a power I really don't even claim to or want to understand very well that not me, loving, caring, and outside of me. And that's about it. I've kind of come full circle back to not a lot of details. Um, and, you know, tune in next year. I may be telling you, my God, wears shorts and carries a tennis racket. I never know what's next on the journey, you know. I may go back to details. But right now, through taking a look at how much I have done, about um, about getting an understanding confused with something I could like comprehend, and how limiting that was to me. You know that the more God, as I understood Him, got human, uh, that's really pretty scary. You know, I don't know if you're the kind of addict that I was and am. But the idea 
that I was recreating this to be more and more like me. Once I realized that's what I was doing, I was like, oh, no, I don't want any part of that. But it took a while. And um, and I had to go through that period of, of being willing to let go of stuff I believed in and understanding that my belief didn't make any difference. It made a difference to me. It didn't mean that things were true or not true. I um, had a similar trip, I guess, with the meditation part of it. I had heard a lot of different things that I'm sure are all true um, about meditation. Prayer is, list- is talking to God, meditation is listening, um, that we have now our own daily meditation book, and people have used you know, different meditation books over the years, and, and that was meditation. And I tried a lot of those things, um, and I always had a sense that there was a a better way for me to approach that. But when I kind of tried to take little steps in that direction, I didn't get anywhere. I couldn't make anything work. I'd gone and checked out some different ways uh, that people had found to meditate a little more formally, and I just, I couldn't do it, you know. Some of it was totally ridiculous, you know, the breeze through your feet kind of stuff. And um, some of it seemed like it was working for them. I just couldn't get there. And my mother had one of her cousins coming over. We're talking about a white-haired old man that I'd never met. So I said hi and left, you know, to go to a committee meeting. And it was this nice white-haired old man, and when I came back, a couple hours later, the conversation had shifted, and he was talking about meditation, and that he'd taught it for 20 years, and um, he showed me a way that I've been able to use. It's not terrifically, you know, different or wonderful, but I can tell you the one piece of information that made it accessible to me. Because what would get in my way when I would try to just be quiet was the chatter in my head, you know, the stuff in my head that just would not stop. So it was impossible for me to just sit still and be quiet, whether I watched a candle, counted breath, you know, any of that stuff. I couldn't do any of it because my head was too busy. And so this man said to me, think of that as the river of your mind. You stand on the bank and watch it flow by. If you jump in every once in a while, that's okay. When you recognize you're in the the river, climb out, stand on the bank again, and watch it go by. I can do that. It's so similar to me to the 12 steps that I knew for me it was the right thing. Because when I got to these rooms, I heard you people talking about a lot of ways to be and goals that were old news. I'd heard them all my life, but I never had any way to get there. You know, I never had anything that I could put my hand on right then and get there with it. And that's what that piece of information about the river of my mind did for me. You know, I'm not as rigorous about that one as I wish I were either. Um, And... um, I think that I, I received benefits that I'm not aware of because the one other piece of information I was given that I think was real valuable was that if I started just trying to be quiet and that it wasn't about doing anything, just being quiet, that wonderful thoughts and insights would start to come to me, which I should seriously ignore because they were my head. <laughs> and uh, So I think I get the benefits from that. Maybe a couple of days later, all of a sudden something's a little bit clearer. During the day, the next day, maybe I'm a little bit calmer. I trust that it benefits me because that's the direction that's in the step. I'm supposed to seek through prayer and meditation. I guess if I had anything... Um, that I would hope to be able to give about this step, about all three steps. It's probably that for me the most important word in the 11th step is only. 
and it's the hardest one for me to stick to. Praying only the knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry it out. Well, once again, I certainly am in the right place. When I manage to pray only for knowledge of his will for me and the power to carry it out, if that's what I ask for, the answer is always yes. Here you are. Every time. Never fail. When I get off into that other stuff, um, then sometimes I get a yes, sometimes I get a no, and sometimes I get an if you insist. The if you insist usually turn out to be real painful. Occasionally I insist anyway. Because I haven't taken enough of a beating with me and my fine mind, sometimes I'll sit there and try to figure out just how I could work it to really manage to pray for this thing I want and get every T crossed and I dotted so well that there wouldn't be some little back door where I was going to wind up getting bit, you know? And you know, if I think that through long enough, I wind up with what I really want is not only just his will for me and the power to carry it out. It works so much better. However, I don't always think it through. Sometimes I insist. I um, I had surrendered custody of my son when he was about six years old. His dad and I had divorced. And the outside advice we had got was because he was a boy and because he was six. He should be with his dad for the next few years if he was ever going to be with him. So I gave up custody. We had talked about that when he was about 12. It would probably be about time for him to come back to me. By the time he was 12, his father had forgotten those conversations ever took place. And so I was just trying to work on accepting that, trusting that, uh, you know, it's all a gift. The fact that I don't like it doesn't mean it's not a gift. It just means I don't like it. And um, I had also been through a series of relationships that were painful enough to get me willing to finally take a break and learn something, so I didn't keep doing the same one over and over with different faces. And that break, I figured six months ought to do it. It lasted about five years. And uh, at the end of that time, I just, you know, I took a risk. I said, okay, God. I think I'm ready to have a man in my life again. And two days later, my ex-husband called me and said, he's 14, I can't stand it, I'm sending him back. <laughs> That's probably my happiest example of taking one of those risks of praying for what I think I want. And although the answer wasn't exactly what I had in mind, it was okay. Um, some of them have had far less happy endings. And as I say, all I can say is that it shows that uh, I'm qualified for my membership here, that every once in a while I will, I will still do that. The other way that I've done that is I will get off the beam and not realize it, you know, and start praying for stuff that seems like perfectly wonderful program kind of stuff to pray for. Um, I used to do this with, like, assets as a way to deal with defects. Don't do that. <laughs> it's sort of like if I played for patience, I would get lots of chances to be patient or not. I prayed for faith one time, and those lessons damn near kill me. Um, but until I talked about that, you know, in these rooms, and somebody said to me, oh, wait a minute, wait a minute, you don't want to do that, you know, it seemed like a really good idea. So there are ways that I've gotten away from the only and not seen it, that, that I was away from it real clear, you know, right there. It's also the way I pray for other people. I ask for God's will to be done in their life, as it is in mine, so that I'm praying still. If we're supposed to, 
you know, pray for other people to have what I want for myself. Well, as much as I'm able to, I pray for knowledge of God's will for me and the power to carry that out. So that's how I pray for other people, people that I love and people that I'm really angry at. Whatever it is, whatever reason is that they're on that list to get prayed for, same thing. That they also get knowledge of God's will for them and power to carry that out. Now, I will tell you that with some of the ones that are on the list because I'm really angry, the only way I can bring myself to do that, at least for the first few days, is to convince myself that God's will for them may be a bigger disaster than anything I could cook up. And uh, that's okay, because after I've done it for a couple of days, I start to mean it. I think that that's one of the true miracles for me, because, boy, I held grudges when I got here. I mean, on that first four step. There were people I hadn't seen in 20 years, but I knew what I was going to say to them if I ever saw them again, you know, to be free of that. I had um, I had a situation recently, and, um, and I was prepared to be hateful about it. I was kind of looking forward to it, actually. I was relishing it. I'd played it over in my mind on several occasions, you know. And um, I'd done that enough. I knew I needed to start praying for this person. And I'd only done that for a few days. And when the situation was in front of me, it just wasn't like that. And one more time, I came out going, well, God, I was all set to be hateful, and you fixed it, so I had to be grateful instead. Although it involved giving up all that sick fun, (laughs) <laughs> of using our skills to, you know, attack somebody or cut them down or, or um, any of that. In the long run, I'd rather be the kind of person the program will allow me to be if I only do it. Yeah. I um, I think that along with the knowledge... I'm always given the power. I don't always take it. I don't think I get the knowledge of God's will for me without, at that instant, having the power to carry it out. I don't always take it, and usually what gets in the way is, is fear, or what I choose to call fear. And it sure feels like fear. But here's where I get the step snarled up again. Through writing about that, through looking at what that is, it became apparent to me that when I act out of fear, that's when I'm in active addiction because that's what at least the end of my addiction real clearly was all about. I was afraid of everything all day long. I mean, I was afraid to go to the front door. I was afraid to get my mail because I had snakes in the mailbox. I was afraid to go to the grocery store because I had mutilated bodies in the trunk of my car and I knew the box board was going to be upset. None of this stuff was real. I was just real crazy, you know. <laughs> and, uh, um, and walking around that crazy, afraid somebody's going to find out. But when I act out of the fear and don't take the power, what I wind up doing is I do it my way. You know, I do it the old way. I do what I damn well please. And sometimes I can come to the room, talk to you all about how frightened I am, and you'll sympathize with me. It's a great system, isn't it? Um, I don't mean to say that that's ever resulted in me doing a day where I didn't experience fear as it hasn't, or that I don't still sometimes act out of the fear instead of taking the risk. But like a lot of other things, it's no fun anymore. I can't lie to myself about what I'm doing. And once the ignorance is gone, it's harder and harder for me, you know, to keep acting on it. But again, you know, for me, the ability to know that if the knowledge of his will for me is there, then so is the power to carry it out, whether I think so or not. 
and the willingness to act on that, I'm right back to trust, to changing the amount of trust I'm willing to put on this power. And uh, my belief is, you know, based on the experience I've had and what I see in people who uh, come before me, is it's kind of like a muscle. The more, to the best of my ability, I do that, the more I try, the stronger that gets, the more able I'll be to do it the next time. Yeah. I get a lot from um, listening and probably even more from watching people who were in the rooms when I got here to see that that can and will continue to improve as long as I'm willing to continue to try to do something with it. And basically, that's coupled up with um, whatever that is, you know, when I start seeing or feeling to know that, that I don't like that part of me, then I don't have to do that way anymore. It's just like at my first meeting, you all told me that I didn't have to use it anymore. And I was sick and tired enough for that to be true. No, I didn't use them anymore. The same way with my fears, the other character defects, and my willingness and ability to um, put my trust in this power greater than myself. When I really don't want to be that way anymore, I don't have to be. I, um, I was so unspiritual, I guess, and resistant to it when I was new. That I clearly remember saying at one time um, that I knew I'd had a spiritual awakening because when I got to step 12, it told me I had. And um, what I know now is that I had a spiritual awakening the second day I was clean because I woke up and I didn't want to use. And I didn't even recognize it at the time. Sometime in my first few weeks, I had probably one of the most important spiritual awakenings I've ever had is that suddenly I saw that drugs were the problem, not the solution. And I didn't even recognize it. Whatever my most recent one was, I probably didn't recognize it either. Sometimes I get like, news flashes, you know, or something's real dramatic. But a lot of the time, it's only with hindsight that I realize what's been done for me. I struggled a lot with the word spiritual. I didn't understand it. I would ask questions. I asked this one person whose recovery I really respected, and they said, well, why don't you grow up, get a job, pay your bills, and mind your own business? I thought they hadn't understood the question. And um, today I, I know they understood the question just fine. I just didn't understand the answer um, or didn't want to. Finally, somebody told me that a spiritual awakening was a change in attitude, that I could get some kind of a handle on. That's when I could see that my attitude toward drugs had changed 180 degrees. Yeah. All the other changes are in process. I'm not sure there's one I'd want to claim that same 180 turn for on any other area. Um, how I monitor that puts me back with how I deal with the people that cross my path today. For me, it really doesn't have a lot to do with my relationship with the loving God, higher power. That relationship was totally on 100% all my life. It was on in the depths of my addiction because it's the only way I lived to get here. And I don't have the power to alter that. It's the ultimate arrogance for me to think that my power to offend is greater than God's power to forgive. So I try to stay out of that one. But I can check that on just how I deal with people. That's my barometer for what kind of shape I'm in. 
how awake I am spiritually. I was given this prayer that, that really helps me a lot. It's, it's a lot like that little farm boy joke on step 10. And it goes, God treat me tomorrow the way I treat other people today. Somebody gave me that prayer, and it was probably a week before I actually started to say it. And I recognized that I was afraid to say it. So it showed me that somewhere I had climbed into some kind of idea of a God that was going to punish me, which is not what I wanted. This being Narcotics Anonymous was the freedom for me to change that understanding whenever it needs to change. I changed that one fast when I realized that that's what was making me hesitant about saying that. Once I started saying that, which is some years back, it made me pay more attention to how I treated other people today. I, um, I think that that spiritual awakening is uh, like a never-ending process. And for me, it's linked with figuring out that my task here was to become human, which I didn't know for a long time. I was a real slow learner about some things. I thought for, oh, easy, the first 10 years, um, that if I worked this stuff really hard, that the program of Narcotics Anonymous would take me to this exalted plane where nothing would bother me. That's what drugs did when I was lucky. And that is not what recovery's done. But I really thought that was where I was supposed to be able to get to. And finally, it dawned on me, and I had help, um, that my task here was to become human. And even more than that, to let you see that which is probably the harder of the two. I learned that because on those occasions when I would be in these rooms and be human, because it was in so much pain, I didn't have a choice to be any other way, that people responded to that. And often when I thought I was being, you know, profound or had the word on recovery, people were intimidated. You know, and put off, which was not what I wanted. And I had to take a look at that. Because I remember this woman, when I first got clean, that um, going into a room where Carol was, was like standing next to a warm stove. It just made you feel good. And how much that had meant to me when I was new. And how that was one of the people who had something that I wanted. So how did I get to this big double-digit recovery and find out that that was not what I had? And a lot of the answer was in me thinking that if I worked it really hard and was really rigorous, I was going to get to some kind of recovery perfection, you know, or, or not feeling stuff or being calm and spiritual, no matter what happens, you know. And it's just one more time, I had it backwards. And I learned that through a series of events that, that, you know, I had no choice but to be honest about them. And finding out one more time that I'm instructed to be honest around here because it works. And that when I would talk about the stuff that I wasn't willing to talk about, that's when I had a message to carry. A good example was um, when I put my son on the plane to go back and see his dad for a long time, um, I'd be talking to him in a dance about, you're going to go fishing, you're going to go camping, trying to get him excited about where he was heading, big smiley thing at the airport. He'd be all happy jumping on the plane, and I would be destroyed driving home from the airport. And one year, it didn't work. And he was 
real unhappy and had a few little tears. And you know, when I went home from the airport that way, that day, I was just fine. Because the truth was, when something I love goes away from me, I think it ought to wither and die. And if this little kid loved me so damn much, why is he so happy when he's leaving? But all my stuff about who mom was supposed to be made that not okay. But when I gave that up in a meeting, that that's who I really was about that stuff, all kinds of people said, me too. Either they were glad to hear it, or, yeah, they knew that about them, and welcome to the club. Those are the secrets that keep me sick. Not the stupid stuff we all did, and I certainly did when I was using. My secrets aren't any more interesting than anybody else's about that nonsense. That stuff that I believe makes me a monster. And in fact, makes me a human being trying to get better. Those secrets are what keeps me sick. My unwillingness to share those secrets. Um, When my mother was dying, to talk about the times when I would sit there across from her and would be fussing and my head would go, old lady, why don't you die and leave me your money and make my life better? That I could say that and understand that I didn't have to take action on it, that it passed, but just that I could admit that. That's where I started to get that kind of freedom. That's where I think I started to really get some awakening of the spirit and become more of a human being when I stopped trying to be some kind of um, recovery poster child. My job is to get transparent. And the better I do with that, the more willing I am to do that, even when it's scary and my head still says, if I tell you the truth about this one, you're never going to want to have anything to do with me. Because it still does. That's when I show what um, what's been done for me as a result of these steps. That I can tell you that's who I am, and I can stay clean anyway, and I can be better tomorrow. The um, the thing about you know carrying the message, I try to keep it to my experience, strength, and hope. I try to stay out of theory. I get into theory of what I heard somebody else tried. I haven't done it yet, but it sounds good. Then I don't have sponsees. I have guinea pigs, (laughs) which I don't think they'd appreciate. So I don't ask them to write it unless I wrote it. I didn't give anybody that when it was due, the the four-step guide until I'd written the four steps out of it. I just try to really um, carefully limit myself to what I have done and what I've learned as a result of what I have done. I think the other thing I try to do about carrying the message is I take personal responsibility that in California you have to hold your hand up for the first 30 days. You don't have to. You're asked to. That somebody, if I don't see somebody else doing it, then it must be me talks to that woman that had her hand up, that I write my number down, um, and that and that I try not to share all my experience, strength, and hope. Obviously, I have a tendency to talk a lot, so I try to remember with newcomers, you know, that what I remember is the smiles. What I remember is the hugs and handshakes. And just to keep coming back, you know, you don't have to use me anymore. We're glad you're here. I don't remember anything profound. The only thing I remember from my first meeting is that we're under no surveillance at any time. That's it. Um, The hardest place for me to practice the principles is at home. The more I care about someone, the tougher time I have. And I'm staying in the principle. The more my ego's involved, the more my emotions are involved. Um, my son being the worst, I mean the worst for me to try to practice the principles with. Till sometimes, um, it's five minutes at a time. This child is 20 now. It's got his own joke. It's like arguing with myself. <laughs> and he has been a pot smoking beer drinker since he was 15. 
And that's been a real process for me to back up off that. To try to not do to him, because he's my baby boy, everything that I know does not work. You know? I want to do it anyway. I'm his mother. What can I tell you, you know? To get up off it. And finally, probably within the last year, I've been able to recognize the gift that he tells me the truth about it, you know, and decide that that's more important, that he tells me he's a pot smoking beer drinker than the fact that he is one. He's a high school dropout. And I struggled with that one. And finally, I got a really wonderful suggestion. I told him I thought he needed to retire and be retired for a while. That was in... January. He started college last week, but it's all his idea. He told me that once he got all that THC out of his head, it was amazing how much better he did with his studies and that they were kind of interesting. And I managed to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> Total gift of a loving God, I managed to keep my mouth shut about, you know, wailing on him uh, for four years. Because I don't think it's the four years of wailing on him that did it. I think it's the slightly less than one year of not wailing on him, you know. He didn't need me for drug education. He's a kid in the American public school system. That, not to mention the street and his buddies. He's got more drug education than I do. And uh, he thinks this is all his idea. And I kept my mouth shut on that one, too. I don't know where he got so stubborn. I think it must have been from his father's side of the family. <laughs> but, um, you know, this was all his doing. Yeah. And it just shows me one more time, another lesson I seem to have to learn endlessly, that the best way I can practice these principles in all my affairs is to get over the idea that I've got a hand to play. Yeah. And I think particularly with this child, to constantly remind myself that he has a higher power working in his life, too, and I'm not it. That they don't get issued at 16 like driver's license or 21 like voting permits, you know. But that's always been on there. And that if I would get out of the way, maybe you'd have an even better chance to work. I think that I'm through. So thank you all for listening so patiently. Thanks again for the committee to ask me to share. Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Please help us improve our ranking so others can find us by putting a review on Stitcher, iTunes, or your favorite podcast index. Napot is ad-free thanks to the folks supporting the show with a dollar more per month. If you enjoy listening, you can join them by going to napot.xyz and looking for the donate link. Thank you for listening. Have a great day.